Where people go wrong with sunscreen, other than just not using it, is using it the wrong way. And the one thing that I really would focus on would be our children. And one thing I see all the time whenever I go on vacation are kids at the beach and a parent has a sunscreen spray and they're just spraying a cloud of sunscreen all over their children. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am very excited to be talking with Dr. Tony Yoon, America's holistic plastic surgeon, who just released a new book called Younger for Life. And in his new book, it's a step-by-step -step guide to turning back the clock holistically for vibrant, beautiful skin using the process of auto-juvenation. And Younger for Life includes how to reverse the aging process with auto-juvenation promoting foods, a simple skincare routine that will make your skin look young and healthy, best practices for sleep, exercise, thinning hair, beautiful teeth, and mindset, everything you ever wanted to know about non-surgical treatments like Botox, fillers, lasers, red light, and more, and a simple three-week jumpstart to look and feel amazing. He is huge on TikTok. He's got over 5 million followers on YouTube, and he is teaching very important things about how you can do non-invasive things. And he also obviously has been a surgeon, so he's just a wealth of knowledge. Dr. Tony, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hey, thank you so much, Talar. I'm real excited to chat with you today. Yeah, yeah, likewise. So uh, really excited about your new book. And let's um, maybe tell people about a little bit of background, actually, kind of leading up to how you kind of came to this auto juvenation process, and then maybe talk a little bit about what that is. Yeah, so I started uh, my career like any plastic surgeon. I went through four years of medical school. I did three years of general surgery residency. I did two years of plastic surgery. And then I did a year fellowship, uh, which is like an apprenticeship out in Beverly Hills with a top name plastic surgeon. Then I started my practice uh, where I'm at now in uh, the outskirts of Detroit uh, in Michigan. And uh, I thought that I, I had reached the pinnacle of success many years into my practice. I started way back in 2004. And I had a patient who had a terrible complication after a facelift. And this complication got me really into thinking because, you know, it wasn't her fault. It wasn't my fault. Just sometimes when you operate, there's always a risk of something bad happening, no matter whether you dot all your I's and cross all your T's. Uh, and so it really got me into thinking that, was I taught wrong? You know, and in residency and throughout our training, we're always taught all about surgery, 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 and, and we become these kind of cut first doctors. And I started realizing after this complication that everything I was taught about the goal of being a plastic surgeon was wrong. The goal of being a plastic surgeon is not to bring my patients to the OR, it should be the opposite. It should be, how do I keep my patients out of the operating room, yet still help them look and feel their best? And even though I didn't get any training in nutrition or preventative treatments or anything like that throughout my entire training, it's crazy when you think about it, I decided then to dedicate myself from that point on into how do I help my patients to get where they want to be, hopefully without going under the knife. And that became the principles of autojuvenation. And autojuvenation basically means that our bodies contain immense regenerative abilities to turn back the clock naturally. But in order to do that, we have to give it the right tools and the right environment for it to do so. And so really autojuvenation is the basis of my new book. And there are five main factors that we focus on in autojuvenation. It's mm -hmm. what you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare and non-invasive treatments. And that's what I'm really trying to put out there right now is for people to realize that our bodies have these immense regenerative abilities. We just have to teach them how to unlock it. And hopefully, hopefully, not always, but hopefully we can help prevent them from going under the knife. Amazing. I absolutely love doctors like yourself who, and we've had a couple others on here as well, who are trained as surgeons, but do everything they can to help their patients avoid surgery. I think that's just a really great thing. And I know, look, who, who wouldn't want the results of a facelift, but no one wants to, you know, most people don't want to go through having a facelift or doing things of that nature. So really excited for this topic. Um, maybe we can kind of hit a little bit on each of those five pillars um, that you spoke about. So I guess starting with uh, what you what you eat does what you eat really have a big impact? And when we're talking about you know what you talk about in your book, is it just we're not just talking about appearance as well? We're probably talking about yeah. literally turning back the clock, but also visibly with your appearance as well, right? So does what you eat really affect your appearance uh, as long as you let's say are not gaining weight? 
Yeah, it does. You know, and, and to go off of your point, as far as, you know, we're not talking just about external appearance. Interestingly, there was a study that looked at twins and twins who are two people who are genetically identical. And they found that the younger looking of the two genetically identical twins typically lived longer than the older mm -hmm. looking one. Now, you know, we don't know if that's causation, if it's correlation, but but in general, if you look younger in general, you are going to have potentially more longevity. And that could be because maybe what's on the inside is presenting itself that way. And so, yes, definitely what you eat can have a profound impact on the appearance of your skin. And when we mm -hmm. look at the skin, the first thing I would focus on is collagen. Now, collagen mm -hmm. makes up about 70 to 80 percent of our skin, of the structure of our skin. And it's the part of our skin that makes our skin feel tight and firm and youthful. But we lose about 1% of the thickness of collagen every year. Uh, mm -hmm. And women after menopause lose upwards of 2% a year. Uh, and even in the first five years after menopause, they lose upwards of 30% of the thickness of their collagen. So when we look mm -hmm. at the different ways that food can impact then the collagen of our skin, uh, there are five things that I rec that I tell you or that I basically have found that will age our skin. And food is a huge part of most of those. So, for example, collagen degradation, that's a big part of why our skin ages. And that can be impacted by how much protein that we're putting into our diet because collagen is a protein. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that uh, causes aging of our skin is inflammation. And we know that certain foods can cause chronic inflammation of our, of our bodies and of our skin. And then another part of, of our aging of our skin is free radicals or oxidation. Same thing. There are certain foods like ultra processed foods that are filled with free radicals. They can damage our skin as well. Uh, and then the other two factors of aging of our skin is uh, a loss of uh, or buildup of cellular waste and a reduction of nutrients, nutrient depletion. Well, we know that our food is not as nutritious as it used to be, especially if people are eating a lot of ultra processed foods. So once again, another big part of aging of our skin that's due to the food that we're eating. And so uh, in my book, I try to outline really a diet that's going to support collagen, that's going mm -hmm. to fight off inflammation, that's going to uh, be filled with antioxidants to fight free radicals, and also one that is filled with nutrients to fight that nutrient depletion. Nice. Makes sense. With collagen, can people just buy a collagen protein powder, grass-fed collagen peptides, and, and take 20 grams of collagen protein a day? Is that enough, or does it need to be getting through the food? What do you think? I think really ideally a combination of both would be mm -hmm. best. Now, it's always best to get what you can through your food, okay? Mm -hmm. You cannot supplement yourself out of a bad diet, and a lot of right. people may think that they can do that, and they may take 50 supplements a day, but in the end, really what you want to focus on ideally first is the food that you eat. That being said, you know, there is a controversy. Do collagen supplements work? And the first mm -hmm. thing you want to consider is that collagen supplements are not a complete protein. You should mm -hmm. not count the collagen that you're taking as a supplement as your protein macronutrient. So that you want to count separately. However, there are a lot of studies that have shown that taking a collagen supplement can definitely improve the health and the quality of your skin. There was a meta-analysis back in 2021 of over 1,100 people. They took collagen supplements for 90 days and found a statistically significant improvement in both the hydration uh, of their skin and the wrinkles of their skin. Uh, there was mm. even a more recent meta-analysis uh, of over 1,700 people. This was just published last year, finding very similar findings. And so really the science now is becoming pretty clear that taking a hydrolyzed collagen supplement can definitely uh, impact the health of your skin. Uh, I'm a plastic surgeon, so I really focus on the skin. I haven't looked at studies as far as joints and other types of, of body parts. Um, there isn't anything that I've seen that technically has supported collagen for the hair, although a lot of anecdotal stories. I don't know that there have been any studies that really looked at you know, too closely, at least on a huge level like they have with the skin. Um, but I do believe that overall taking collagen supplements and, and seeing what people have, have told me and what I've heard it can definitely help more than just the skin as well. Nice. And what would you recommend 20 grams a day, let's say for the average person? I think that's reasonable. I mean, really yeah. what you want to do is that there are different types of collagen and I would really focus on making sure you get the right type of collagen for the use that you're looking for. So for example, type one collagen is going to be hair, bone, skin, and nails. Mm. Type two collagen is collagen that is present uh, in your cartilage, and then type three is uh, muscle. And so you want to just make sure that 
uh, you are getting the right type of collagen for the concern that you have. Got it. Yeah. And there's a great point you made as well that a lot of people will see because collagen protein still shows on, let's say you're eating a collagen protein bar or collagen protein powder. It shows protein, 20 grams, but yeah. people are counting that towards their daily, daily protein intake. And that's not correct because it's not really a complete for muscle building protein, right? Yes. Yeah. That's my understanding as well. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. So um, let's talk about the, 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 the next pillar in your, in your, but when to, uh, when to eat. Yeah. So this is something, you know, that the way I look at it, uh, in general, you know, is, is it really is focusing on autophagy. And when you talk to anti-aging scientists, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. There are people who have written fantastic, just fascinating books about how to prolong your life, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, David Sinclair and Neil Berzelai. And, uh, and there's so many great books written about it, but interestingly enough, they don't often focus on the appearance part of it so much. It really is just extending your longevity, extending your health span, which is great, which is more important than, it, than your appearance. However, interestingly enough, you know, in my practice, what I have found is that I get patients who come in and they have terrible health habits. Like, let's say they're smoking a pack a day and they've been smoking a pack a day for 30 years. And I tell them, look, you know, if you smoke, you're going to get emphysema. You're going to have a higher risk of a heart attack. You're going to get COPD. They don't care. But if I say, you know, you can't have a facelift unless you stop smoking for a month, then they quit. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> our vanity is can be used for our actual health benefit. And so the idea behind when to eat is the idea of autophagy and autophagy being a huge part of longevity that anti-aging scientists look at. And when you look at longevity, the number one thing a lot of anti-aging scientists focus on and will tell you is that the number one thing that you can do to technically live longer is to calorie restrict, is to restrict mm -hmm. calories, is not to eat as much. But that's hard. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to decrease your caloric percentage. And this has been studied in rats where they decrease their caloric percentage by, let's say, 20%. And they do live longer. But who wants to eat 20% less in calories every day for the rest of our lives? Like, that's a lot to ask. And so, in the same fashion, we do find that if you intermittent fast or if you fast for periods of time, you can get a similar result. And the idea is you want to focus on um, promoting autophagy. Autophagy is intracellular renewal. It's this intracellular process that goes on in our cells that once they are, they um, do not get uh, fuel sent to them, essentially, once they're not provided fuel, the, the cells of our body will institute a recycling process that will start recycling intracellular debris used organelles, used proteins, discarded mitochondria, and we'll use that for energy, essentially cleaning out the insides of our cells, causing them to function more efficiently, uh, essentially more younger. Now, the process of autophagy slows down as we get older, like pretty much everything else in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so it's super important for us to get that process revved back up. And you can do that by taking time off of eating. You can do that with calorie restriction, but even easier is to do intermittent fasting. And so that's a big part of my book, uh, Younger for Life. Is and, and for me, you know, I'm not one who's going to do a five day water fast. You know, I think that the vast majority of the public, they're not open to that. And so what I'm trying to do is put out there things that are very realistic that you can work yourself up to. And so for a lot of my followers, I say, look, just start with a 12 hour fast. You stop eating at 8 p.m. And then you start again at 8 a.m. the next morning and ideally try to get that up to a good 16 hours where you go mm -hmm. from 8 p.m. Uh, and then you fast until noon the next day. And I do believe that if you will continue to work on your metabolic health, that this is something that most people can do. You don't have to do mm -hmm. it every day, uh, but maybe a couple of times a week can be very nice. And this is a part of the 21 day jumpstart that you mentioned earlier uh, that we tested on people and found that by combining cleaning up their diet, you know, a collagen supporting diet with a little bit of intermittent fasting, not a ton, you don't have to do a ton of it, uh, with skincare and supplements that we got people within 21 days to get them to see great changes in the health and the appearance of their skin and their energy level and even losing a few unwanted pounds. That's incredible. Yeah, I love that. that that's amazing. Yeah, I would love to talk about some of these uh, products as well. Admittedly, I actually don't use any products at all on my face right now, which I know I need to change and get better at. So I want to ask you, how do I get these wrinkles out of my forehead? You know, are there any, are there any, and I literally, I think I just asked someone this recently, I said, are there any products that really work like to help improve the appearance of wrinkles on my forehead or, or things of that nature? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the thing that I would start with is a very basic skincare routine and you have, you've got great skin. So some of what we see, you know, really when we look at studies, about 20% of our health and kind of our, um, you know, how we're doing in general health wise and the appearance of our skin is going to be due to genetics. And 80% of it is going to be due to how you, how your genes express themselves based off of your lifestyle. And so, yes, mm -hmm. you know, you may not be using skincare products, but your skin looks great. Um, that's probably because you've been given good genes. That being said, you're not as old as I am. <laughs> and when you get to that point, when people start getting into their 40s, especially in their 50s, they can really see the difference between somebody who takes care of their skin and somebody who doesn't. You know, when, mm. you're, in, when you're in your 20s, you can go on a bender and, and the next day you feel okay and you look fine. You, it, it's harder to bounce back when you're in your 30s. And then definitely when you hit your 40s, you start seeing the lifestyle from the two decades prior showing itself. Uh, yeah. Now, you can fight that off and you can reverse it by doing a lot of things I recommend, but really it's so important, you know, to get started as soon as you can. So what I usually recommend for somebody like yourself, who's, you know, there are people who will do a 10 step skincare routine. You know, it's like the biohacking right. of skincare, you know, like we have right. friends of ours who are biohackers who will take 50 pills a day. They're cold plunging, you know, they're putting themselves under extreme stress. There are people who do that with their skincare as well. But that's yep. also in a small minority. Uh, and so when you're looking at somebody like yourself to say, hey, let's get you on a 12-step skincare routine, that's not realistic. Right. What is realistic is what I call our two minutes, five years younger skincare routine. And this is something Ooh. that we did test on people where we put them on, we, and this is people who are in general fairly skincare naive, okay? You're, we're not going to take a, you know, somebody like uh, Kelly uh, Ripa or Beyonce uh, and put them on this and they're going to look five years younger. But the average person who doesn't take great care of their skin, you do this for two months. And we found that after two months, people would look upwards of five years younger afterwards. Wow. So this is what it, it only takes two minutes a day. So you start off every morning, you cleanse your skin with a cleanser appropriate for your skin type. And so to Laura, I'll ask you, do you think you have more uh, drier skin or do you think you have more oily skin? Uh, because I'm in Vegas and because the only thing I do in the shower, the only way I wash my face is with super hot water. And then I finish my shower on cold with cold water. So my skin will tend to be dry. Yeah. Dry. Yeah. And especially Vegas. That's mm -hmm. yeah. So that's going to be very different than if you are somebody with, uh, let's say you're African-American and you live, let's say in Louisiana, then you're going to most likely have more oily skin. So mm. for someone like yourself with drier skin, you're in a much drier climate, then you're going to want to use a cleanser that's going to be a more milky or hydrating cleanser. You know, So look mm. for those types of words in the cleanser. If mm -hmm. you're somebody who has more oily skin, if you're in a more humid climate, uh, then you're going to want to look for a more foaming type of a cleanser because that's going to help you control some of that oil. So then the second step, so you want to cleanse your skin every morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Super simple. Don't use bar soap. Use you, For you, you want to use either a milky or hydrating cleanser. After you cleanse your skin, then you want to apply an antioxidant. And, and I mentioned earlier, one of the main uh, causes of our skin aging is free radicals and oxidation. And oxidation and free radicals are neutralized by antioxidants. Okay. And so you want to, and the most popular antioxidant is vitamin C. So you want to go and get a vitamin C serum. Ideally, vitamin C, uh, it's, it's usually fairly fragile and it can get oxidized, meaning that if you get a lot of sun on it, a lot of light on it, it can actually go from kind of a lightish yellow to a dark brown. And that means it's oxidized and may not work as well. Okay, so you want to buy vitamin C serum, one that is ideally in a container that doesn't allow light in. So you apply that vitamin C serum to your skin. That's going to protect your skin against free radicals throughout the day. And then the third step, if you're going to be out especially, would be to use a sunscreen, at least SPF 30. We can talk about sunscreen if you want. I know there's controversies there. But in general, that's what I would recommend. And that's it. So in the morning, you cleanse for you a milky or hydrating cleanser. Then, a, then apply an antioxidant serum like a vitamin C serum. That's going to feel very light on your skin. Uh, and then um, a sunscreen, uh, especially if you're going to be out. That's all you have to do in the morning. If you want to apply moisturizer on top of that, you can. If you're not used to applying it, you don't want to, then by all means, you don't have to. In the evening, same thing. You got to cleanse your skin. If you only cleanse your skin once a day, then do it in the evening because you want to get rid of the day's worth of dust and grime and oil and dirt and pollution and all that type of stuff. So you cleanse your skin at night. And then you want to apply, ideally, some type of an anti-aging moisturizer. The one that we usually recommend is a retinol. 
Retinol is a derivative, vitamin A. Um, it will help to reverse fine lines and wrinkles. It will help to thicken the collagen of the skin. It can even lighten dark spots. So retinol is what most doctors would recommend. And there's a lot of skincare lines that will have a retinol in it. However, you know, you may say, hey, I've got kind of sensitive skin. I'm, I'm in, I, you know, I, I live in the desert. Retinol dries my skin out. What else, what can I use instead of that? Then I would recommend a Bakuchiol based moisturizer. Bakuchiol is from a plant called the Babchi plant. Uh, it's been used in Ayurveda and Chinese medicine for centuries. And there was one study that compared Bakuchiol to retinol head to head and found very similar anti-aging effects. Uh, and so for you, if you say, hey, you know what, I want to use something more mild, then go with the Bakuchiol based cream. And then if you want to apply a moisturizer on top of that, you can, but you don't have to. And technically, that's all you have to do at night. Cleanse your skin, apply a retinol or Bakuchiol, and then a moisturizer on top of it if you feel if you're feeling dry. And then the only other thing is uh, once or twice a week, you want to exfoliate your skin. You can do it with a gentle scrub. You can do it with a uh, light at home peel, but really getting that skin exfoliated once, once or twice a week, it helps to get those skin cells turned over, keeping your skin feeling nice and soft and kind of energized and, and uh, turning over more quickly. That's going to help keep it look, looking smoother as well. And that's it. Literally, it takes two minutes a day. You know, five years younger afterwards was what we found. And this is a big part of our 21 day jump start as well. That's amazing. I'm going to definitely be re-listening to this part of the podcast a few times and make <laughs> sure I get all those. Let's shout out because, you know, I don't know which ones, you know, when you're, when you're looking on the market, if I start Googling vitamin C serum, there's going to be a hundred results. I yeah. saw you have some products on your website. I trust you. What, uh, maybe you could shout out. Do you have all the products you mentioned like on your website? Yeah. So that's part of it. You know, I've got my Yoon Beauty products are made with natural and organic ingredients. They're fragrance nice. free. They're cruelty free. Um, and so we do have actually a two minutes, five years younger skincare routine bundle that we discount as well for people who are like, look, I don't want to go looking for this stuff. I'll just buy it there. You can do that. But also want to let people know that there are other brands out there. You know, ideally, I'm, I'm one for clean beauty. Now, now, and admittedly, the term clean and especially clean products, clean beauty is one that like the term organic has been overused and mm -hmm. doesn't in general mean anything in some cases. Um, so I always want to caution you because it's not like a black and white issue, just like kind of organic is. So, but ideally it's something to, to help you along in your decision-making process to make sure that you get products that don't have a bunch of unnecessary ingredients that could cause potential skin irritation. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about some of those ingredients, but what's the website real quick where people can get those so, products? Yeah, my website is yoonbeauty.com. Nice. Uh, and then for those people, you know, I know we mentioned the book earlier, but we do give a gift certificate of $30. If you live in the United States, uh, we only unfortunately mail the U.S. because of customs issues. Um, mm -hmm. But um, if you order the book, then we have a $30 gift certificate for UMB.com. So if you want to try the products as well, we'll help get you started with it. Amazing. I'm going to be definitely getting that bundle. Um, cool. So what, what are some of the things people should be looking out for in, in the products that they're buying? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing to be careful with is fragrance. Um, you know, I yeah. think fragrance is something that's both alluring and can be both very irritating. And there are some people who have a lot of sensitivities to fragrances. You know, I used to, it's it's funny, you know, one of, the, one of the things I admitted in my book was that when I started my practice, you know, as plastic surgeons, we don't get taught hardly anything about skincare, or at least I didn't. And I think that's probably the majority of plastic surgeons. This is mm -hmm. stuff in general that we learn our, on our own because we're spending most of our time operating on people, treating people in ICUs and trauma bays, you know, people with dog bites, doing breast reconstruction after cancer and stuff like that. We're not spending all that much time learning about skincare. And so we go into practice and we have certain skincare companies who will advertise to us because they're quote unquote medical grade. Uh, and these products typically are pharmaceutical type products um, that have a lot of active ingredients in it, which can be very good to see changes in the skin. And so Talor, for many years, I had my patients on these products. We sold them through my office um, and we saw great changes in people's skin. But for all of those years, I harbored a very, very secret, I guess a secret, <laughs> harbored a secret. And that secret was I could not use these products that I was selling because if I put them on my skin, I would break out into a rash. I would be itchy and have hives and stuff afterwards. And so for years, I just put, I just used what you did. I did soap, water, maybe a little bit of moisturizer and then sunscreen when I go out and that's it. Mm. And when I started getting into more alternative medicine and holistic medicine, 
I started trying natural skincare products, products that were quote unquote clean. And I was shocked because I found that I could actually apply these products onto my skin and I wouldn't react at all. Mm. But the problem with these products I found was that they did not contain the actives that I was selling my patients. And so, you know, they're basically just moisturizers. And so that was why I created my skincare line, Yoon Beauty, was to combine active ingredients like retinol, like vitamin C, like kojic acid and all these with an actual clean formulation without the fragrances. And so that first thing that you see, you know, is when people are attracted to products, number one thing they're attracted to oftentimes is the smell. Well, the mm. smell a lot of times can, have, can be proprietary, and we don't even know what is in the fragrances <laughs> of a lot of these products. Uh, and we don't know how much of that, you know, whether you would react to it or not. And so the first thing that I recommend is to try to go without fragrance in your products. You know, if you do want to have a fragrance, you know, then ideally go for some type of a cologne or perfume that you feel comfortable with, but you don't have to have fragrance in everything that you have. It's just, it's a selling point is all it is. Yeah. So that's yeah. the first thing. Yeah. is fragrance. Mm -hmm. Second thing, there are other, there are other ingredients that you want to look out for. There are formaldehyde releasers uh, out there. There are even class action lawsuits now for certain shampoos that have those in it. There are certain types of parabens that are believed to be hormone disruptors. And even in sunscreen, there's certain sunscreen ingredients that you want to be careful of because they also are potential hormone disruptors as well. Yep. Yep. And uh, is there any common product right now that you're seeing selling like crazy, you know, on the market that you're like, oh, man, the ingredients in that are just are just not good or any specific type of products that tend to be really bad? Sunscreen may be one of them, right? I mean, people just buy whatever sunscreen is being sold at the pool, right? I mean, yeah, I think sunscreen is something that is, I think, so, so important, yet people don't use it necessarily the right way. And so the way I would describe it, you know, we have friends of ours who are in the holistic medicine space. You know, I have a friend of mine who's, he's a big keto biohacker and a uh, great guy. And, and I did a podcast interview with him and he was like, you know, Tony, all I use on my skin is lard. What do you think? I don't use sunscreen. I just use lard. <laughs> like, oh man. So I tell you to Laura, you know, I'm a plastic surgeon. I have had, I've been in practice almost 20 years now. And one thing you'd never want to get is a skin cancer on your face, okay, period. Because I've had people who come in, they go, oh, I don't wear sunscreen. I haven't worn it for a long time, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, you know, I got this little spot on my nose. I'm going to go see a dermatologist. It's just this area that's not healing. And unfortunately, a, a, a wound on your skin that is not healing is concerning, okay, because our wounds should heal. If you've got a wound that just does not heal on your skin, you have to get it checked by a dermatologist because there's a chance that that could be skin cancer. That's one of the, the telltale signs of skin cancer is a non-healing wound in somebody who's overall healthy. And so I've seen this so many times, then they go to a dermatologist and then they come back to see me after they've been treated and they've got half of their nostril gone or the entire tip of their nose has been removed from the skin cancer or they've got a huge portion of their forehead gone or part of their eyelid is gone, it's being pulled down. You do not want to get a skin cancer on your face, period. So I do recommend, especially if you're going to go out to wear sunscreen, I am 100% a fan of getting sun. Uh, I think that it's therapeutic. I live in Michigan where we get days on end of cloudy skies. And I know that when the sun comes out, it's therapeutic to get that sun on your skin. It's great to get it in your eyes when you get up in the morning for your circadian rhythms, but you don't want to get skin cancer on your face, period. Now, where people go wrong with sunscreen, other than just not using it, is using it the wrong way. And the one thing that I really would focus on would be our children. And one thing I see all the time whenever I go on vacation are kids at the beach and a parent has a sunscreen spray and they're just spraying a cloud of sunscreen all over their children. And so we know that there are certain ingredients in sunscreen like oxybenzone and octinoxate that are potential hormone disruptors. Now, if you are spraying this spray onto your children, it's a cloud of dust in the air. They're breathing it into their developing lungs. It just does not sound like a good idea to me. Now, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that, that they have tested children who have breathed this stuff into their lungs, but it just does not sound like a good idea. If you do have a sunscreen spray, let's say, you know, ideally I recommend using mineral-based uh, sunblocks on your children, so either zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide, and you don't want to throw the spray away, spray it in your hand and then apply it to your child. Same thing with your spray. Spray it in your hand, then apply it to your skin. That way you don't waste it. Um, but at the same time, once again, you don't want your kids breathing this into their lungs.
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Just like chemical products and phthalates from perfumes, the same thing. You don't want to be breathing that in. You don't want your kids breathing that in. So it's almost easier just to use the lotion sunblock, right? Not, and not spray at all, right? Yeah, I think the sprays are convenient, but at the same time, it's something that can be really used the wrong way. So yes, for us with, with our kids, and my kids are a little bit older now, so they kind of know what to do. But when the kids were younger, it's the same thing. Like, yeah, we would apply it by hand, ideally go with the mineral-based sunblock. There's no controversy with those. The problem with those, you know, is in somebody who, let's say, has darker skin, then they can cause the skin to look, uh, have a lighter shade. And so if, let's say, you're a, a person of color and you want to apply a sunscreen, which you should, because even though you may not get burned by the sun, you can get premature aging and still get actual uh, skin cancers as well. For those of you who have darker skin, then I recommend using certain chemical sunscreens like avobenzone and Megzoral XL. Those are two ones that have not been shown to be hormone disruptors. Those are chemical based. They're not going to create that lightish hue to your skin that's going to make you feel like you look like ghostly, but still I think are safe as well. Uh, just try to avoid the oxybenzone and the octanoxate, especially in your kids. That's great feedback. What do you think, though? I mean, in terms of like, it's interesting because I've heard a couple of people mention this recently as well about like, I apply sunblock every day. Is that really necessary? I mean, I mean, I know I'm in Vegas as well, so it is kind of sunny almost every yeah. day, which is great. I usually am only getting sunlight early in the morning as the sun is rising. I'm usually not laying out in the middle of the day. Obviously, I'll, I'll wear sunblock if I, if I have, feel like there's a chance I'm going to be burned. But if, if I don't think I'm going to be burned in general, I do. I am afraid of, you know, the ingredients and all. I am one of these crazy biohacker guys who doesn't like putting on sunblock if I don't have to. But yeah. obviously, if I think I'm going to get burnt, if I know I'm going to be in the sun in the middle of the day, I will. But is, is it necessary on a day to day basis, even if it's the sun is not beaming, it's not 90 degrees out? So my dermatologist colleagues will tell you, yes, 100%. Mm. And they wear their sunscreen every day, even if they're going to be in the basement, you know, all day or something like that. Admittedly, Talor, I don't wear sunscreen every day. Uh, definitely, if I'm going to be out, I will wear it. I think it's so important. I also think, once again, living in Michigan, it's important to, to get some sun for the therapeutic effects of it. So I think really moderation and doing kind of what you're saying is you don't want to get burned. Uh, I think if you get a little sun, it's not, you know, the be all end all. But in general, you do want to protect your skin. So uh, for those people who are out a lot, then I would say, yes, you, you should apply sunscreen every day because especially if you've got lighter skin, if you're going to be at higher risk of skin cancer, darker skin is not going to be quite as risky, but still, I think, important. And I think really with all this, it really does come down to there is the sunscreens that we have here in the United States. And one of the things that we're looking at with my Yoon Beauty skincare line, the sunscreens that we have here in the U.S., are very limited. It's very different what you get here in the U.S. versus other countries. And I think that it has put us at a significant disadvantage. You know, when I put moisturizer on my face in the morning, you know, I've got a brightening cream that I put on every day um, because it helps with my dark spots. And I don't feel it. Like I have it on right now and I don't really feel it. But if I wear sunscreen, I feel it. And I know I have it on in the day. And at night yeah. I do when I shower or something or wash my face, I want to get rid of it. Yeah. That's not necessarily the case with sunscreens around the world. It's just here in the United States because we have such a limited array of them. That's the problem. Mm. Um, now, there are some sunscreens. We have some of them at Yoon Beauty that they're not my brand. They're from a brand called La Roche-Posay. They're uh, a brand from Europe that do use, let's say, Mixoral XL that is going to be a bit of a lighter product. But there are also sunscreens that you can buy from other countries like in Korea where the sunscreens are so light and they do feel just like you're applying a regular moisturizer on your, on your face. And I think that that's what we really need here in the United States is for the FDA to allow us to use more types of effective sunscreens that are going to feel lighter on our skin. So for somebody like yourself, for somebody like myself, where, yeah, you know, to put a moisturizer on your skin or a serum on your skin in the morning is not a big deal because you don't feel it throughout the day. Um, it's going to get, I think, better acceptance of it um, and, and, and more people using it regularly. Because I don't think that there's any drawbacks other than we know about but we want to get our vitamin D and all of that. I don't think there's any drawbacks to it. And you definitely, like I said, for someone like yourself where you're Caucasian, you do not want to get a skin cancer somewhere down the line. Like I fear one of my favorite actors, and I think he is the most talented person in Hollywood, is Hugh Jackman. Handsome guy. He's had multiple skin cancers taken off his face. And I fear wow. for the guy that one day it's going to be, let's say, on his eyelid Ooh. or on the nose, and it's going to completely disfigure him, you know, or part of his lip be gone. Like, 
I mean, it's, it's a horrifying thought and you do not want to go down that road, my friends. It makes a lot of sense. That, that's a very, very valid, fair warning that uh, I'm glad I heard. That, that's, I think I'll change some things because of that. So thank you for that. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the hot topics, uh, Botox and, and other kind of common things that I'm not sure even what, what all the people are doing these days, but I know Botox is a big one. So what are some, maybe some of the most more common ones and what's your opinion on Botox? Is a little Botox okay? Is too much bad? What, what do you think? Yeah, Botox is the most popular cosmetic treatment probably in the history of the world. Uh, mm. Every year, upwards of seven or more million Americans get Botox treatments. And we do it here in my office pretty much all day, every day. Um, so Botox is a toxin. It's one of the most powerful toxins in the world. Uh, and it is derived from a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. Now, if you inject a small amount of Botox into somebody like yourself, healthy man, takes great care of himself, it will kill you like very quickly. But if we inject the most minuscule amount into certain muscles of our face that create wrinkles when those muscles contract, it will cause that the Botox will actually prevent the transmission of nerve impulses to that muscle, causing that muscle to relax temporarily for about three to four months. And hmm. so there are certain wrinkles of our face uh, faces that are caused, that are called dynamic wrinkles that are caused by muscles. And those wrinkles typically are the crow's feet wrinkles, the wrinkles that mm -hmm. radiate out from the sides of your eyes, the horizontal forehead wrinkles, and the frown lines between the eyebrows. Those are all caused by muscles. And so if those muscles are not contracting, then those wrinkles do not form. And so that's the idea behind Botox is if you inject it into those muscles, it blocks the transmission of nerve impulses to those muscles and those wrinkles end up smoothing out. Now, it takes about anywhere from two days up to a week for it to work. So initially when you inject Botox, it doesn't work right away. You don't really see anything. But starting around two days up to a week, depending on how quickly your body does it, you'll start noticing that you can no longer contract those muscles. And that will last for upwards of three to four months. There's a newer version on the market called Daxify that appears to last closer to six months. Uh, and then it wears off. So what are the big negatives? What are the dangers? Okay, as, as long as you're staying away from crazy stuff like black market Botox and stuff like that, then the risks from what we can tell are pretty darn low. You know, we have treated in my practice to lower probably 20, 20 to 30,000 people with Botox over the last 20 years, at least, because it's so popular. And I have not had a single case that I know of of a patient getting sick from it or having any type of a major complication. The worst we've had, I think, is two episodes of a bit of a droopy eyelid for a while. And that's when the Botox migrates, unwanted migration from, let's say, the crow's feet area to the eyelid and causes the muscle of the eyelid op that opens it to weaken. And that mm -hmm. typically you can improve by doing some eye drops and then it wears off in three to four months and it's gone. Uh, but we have not had anybody who's had, it's not like breast implants where there's a concern with breast implant illness and people get sick, you know, autoimmune type stuff. Um, we've never seen that in my practice. However, there are, if you go down the rabbit hole of social media and online and the web, you will find small groups of people, let's say on Facebook, they may have groups where they believe they've been injured by Botox. But unlike breast implants, it, it's nowhere near those types of numbers. Um, so in general, I do believe Botox is safe as long as it's performed by a professional, as long as you're buying real Botox and injecting it well. I tell you, you know, we're friends with a lot of people in the holistic health space, alternative medicine space, biohacking space, so many of them use Botox. So mm. many of them. It's so funny. Um, yet, yeah, hey, you know what? Like me, they're talking about eating healthy and all that. Can you, you know, and so the question is, can you be somebody who's promoting health and still get Botox? I believe the answer is yes. Interesting. What about like uh, people who are using it heavily over and over for 20 years, right? Like, I think, I think that's a big fear uh, of, of many people that I've spoken with. They're like, well, you know, once I start, then I'm going to keep doing it. And then in 20 years from now, my face is going to look weird. Like you've seen, obviously we've seen people who have obviously had too much either Botox or other work done on their face, right? Yeah. So what happens when you use it a lot for a long period of time? Uh, one thing, there was a study that I need to let you know about I don't know what the ramifications of it are. I don't think we know at this point, but Botox has been used for, gosh, 30, 40 years or so, um, where there was a rat study where they injected Botox into the facial muscles of a rat, and actually they got their spinal cord fluid, the CSF, and they found a little bit of botulinum toxin in that spinal fluid. Now, mm -hmm. 
to our knowledge, there's no evidence that it does anything like increase your risk of Alzheimer's or dementia or anything like that. Uh, but that was a finding that we found in a very small rat study. Other than that, long-term effects, you know, when you think about long-term, those are things you worry about. You know, is it going to increase your risk of any diseases? You know, unlike, and I'm, I don't, I, I, like, let's say Ozempic, which I'm mm -hmm. not, a, you know, I'm not plus or minus. I think it could be right for the right people. You know, Ozempic has been used maybe for years. Botox has been used cosmetically for like 30 years or so, you know. And so we have a ton of data. It's been used a lot. And there are so many people who've been on it. You know, that in general, if this was something, in my opinion, that were to cause a true like disaster big issue, we would probably know by now because it has been around so much and used so much. But what yeah. bad can happen with long use of Botox? OK, uh, well, number one, you can get uh, resistance to it. You can develop antibodies to it. If you've had it for too long, your bodies can develop antibodies that can attack the Botox potentially, theoretically, and maybe cause it not to work so much as well. That's one mm. reason why I'm not a fan of teenagers getting Botox. You know, there's this idea mm. of uh, prejuvenation. Uh, and some people, I think it's a big money grab. Some people are trying to say, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you're 18, you're in your early 20s. You don't have wrinkles there, but we want to prevent the wrinkles by injecting Botox. I'm not a fan of that. I think that's unnecessary. And yeah. the worry that I have, you know, number one, it's still it's a medical procedure. But number two is that if you're injecting it when you're young and you don't technically can't, you're not benefiting from it then when you can benefit from it, when you're in your 50s, when you're in your late 40s, maybe you'll have antibodies to it and you can't use it then. And then now you basically just gave that away. Yeah. So that's yeah. the first thing is antibodies that can render it useless. And then the second thing is, yes, you can get atrophy of muscle uh, where the muscles get smaller and smaller. Um, cosmetically, you know, there are actually indications for Botox that we use to do that on purpose. Uh, when hmm. people have spastic muscle disorders, we inject Botox to relax those muscles like a spas uh, esophageal spasm. Um, but we also do that cosmetically. We'll inject Botox into the masseter muscles, which are the muscles on the sides of the jawline to narrow the jawline in some people. You know, people who, let's say, grind their teeth a lot at night, they chew a lot of gum. A lot of Korean, I'm Korean American, a lot of Koreans have just overgrowth of that muscle. And so injecting it into that muscle can cause atrophy eventually because that muscle is not working anymore and cause those muscles to shrink down a bit. Um, so can atrophy of your muscles that you injected, you know, create an issue? I don't know if you, if you stick with those kind of indications, those three muscles, the forehead, the frown lines and the crow's feet, those muscles getting smaller, I don't think are a huge deal. Okay. Yeah. So, so overall, if someone started when they were 45, they're not going to look, their face isn't going to look weird when they're 65. In fact, it probably will look good. Right. No, as long as it's done, I think, appropriately. I think the yeah. difference with that, you know, I think what you're probably and a lot of people are mistaking it with is filler. Yeah. Um, so filler is the number two most popular cosmetic treatment. That's a whole different story. So filler basically uh, is injectable. It's the way I describe it. It's like injectable skin, like liquid skin. So we inject areas causing them to plump up. The original fillers was collagen. We talked about how collagen is a majority of our skin. Uh, we would inject collagen into the lips and into the uh, smile lines, the lines from our nose to the corners of our mouths. So that was the original filler. Now we have hyaluronic acid fillers. Hyaluronic acid is a natural moisturizer of our skin. It's the great thing about HA fillers, hyaluronic acid fillers, is that we can make them thick, so we can inject them into the cheeks to elevate the cheeks. You can make it really thin, so you can inject it under the eyes to fill in under eye hollows. Uh, and we can make it feel nice and soft. So you can inject it, let's say, in the lips to plump up the lips. And hyaluronic acid fillers are completely reversible, uh, and that's another benefit of it. But you know, like I think in anything in plastic surgery, a little may be a good thing, but a lot can be a bad thing. And I think what you're probably looking at and we look at with some of the real housewives is when people have been overfilled and you've got these just over plump cheeks, these over plump lips. Mm -hmm. Those are things that, yes, long term could potentially create issues with scar tissue, um, mm. with what we call granulomas, especially if they're not using an HA filler, even with potential infection and lumpiness and stuff like that, especially depending on the type of filler they're using. Uh, but Botox is a different type of a product. That's a really good distinction. Really, really good to know. What about other things like more non-invasive things like red light, uh, red light therapy, lasers, things of that nature? Any any good success there? Yeah, I think, you know, for your listeners, if they say, hey, you know what, I'm kind of new to this anti-aging space as far as getting my skin better. You know, I think I want to do a, a good, simple skincare routine like what we talked about. 
Um, but but you don't, let's say, want to go to a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon's office or a med spa, then the easiest thing is to get a red light therapy device. You know, I'm a mm-hmm. big fan of red light therapy. I've got two of them at home myself. Red light therapy, basically, the idea behind it is that the light, the, the light energy from the red light device will help to power the mitochondria of your cells. And I know that you've talked about mitochondria on your podcast before and how important that is to overall um, our aging process and our overall metabolic health. And so like the other parts of our body where you want your mitochondria to be uh, that powerhouse to be really revved up and functioning well, that's the same idea with the skin. And so the idea then is you use this red light device The red light essentially will help to power the mitochondria to produce more ATP, essentially acting like they are more youthful cells. And there are studies where they've done split face studies where they treated one half of the face with red light and the other half with a sham laser and found an improvement in both collagen and the elastin in the skin afterwards Mm. with the red light therapy. Some of those studies found those results in as little as a month after, although I would expect closer to two to three months of regular use before you really start seeing any changes of your skin. Uh, Benefit of red light therapy, you can do it at home. Um, When you compare that to the cost of, let's say, laser treatments in an office, you know, Botox, filler, bang for your buck is going to be probably best with red light therapy. Um, I mean, bang for your buck is number one with, let's say, a retinol or Bacuchel cream because it's not that expensive. But getting up there, the next one would be something like a red light therapy device. And are those, are there devices that just only cover the face or would would you recommend if people can afford them? I know they're sometimes expensive, a full red light panel where they kind of go there with their shirt off and get their face and their whole body. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that there, there are four ways that, that I have seen people do it. The first way I don't recommend it's the least expensive. There are red light handheld devices that you kind of move around your face, which to me, I mean, if you've got all the time in the world and you're going to sit there every, you know, every other night and kind of move this around your face, then okay, go ahead. You can save money by doing that. Um, but there are masks that you can wear that look kind of creepy. I have one of those. Mm-hmm. It, it goes on for 10 minutes, a couple of times a week. I actually have started now meditating during the time I have that on. I'm like, well, I might as well multitask. <laughs> right. I'll put that because I can't do anything else with this thing on my face with the red light. Uh, yeah. So now I just meditate when I do that. Um, so the, the masks, I think, are really practical. There are tabletop devices that you can get. Uh, I'm a fan of one called the Loom Box. So those are for the whole face. So you're not having to once again move your hand around. And then the whole the beds, you know, I think unless you are Dave Asprey and you've got all the money in the world potentially to buy one of those, I don't even think that he has one in his house. Maybe Kim Kardashian might. But uh, usually that's something you got to go to a med spa or, a, you know, some type of a wellness center to do that. Gotcha. Gotcha. This has been really, this has been really great. A uh, lot of great uh, tips here. I know there are other aspects as well that our community, we've done a lot of to- uh, episodes on sleep. And then we know obviously the importance of sleep uh, for oh, yeah. skincare and, and, and youthfulness that we didn't really get a chance to talk about, but we've done a lot of other episodes about it. And, uh, and exercise obviously is another one that you, that you mentioned as well. Um, that's obviously a big topic here, but this has been great. Anything, anything we should know specifically about exercise, any specific type that's better than, than others that you found? You know, I think that there's, there are people who are exercise um, specialists that will have more information, can really get into that, especially like yourself, better than me. Yeah. But the one thing that I really would encourage, you know, for me, I'm 51 and I see some of my friends and my relatives who are older than me and lack of mobility and balance, I think, is such a huge deal. You know, I'm a big yeah. fan. I'm a good friend of Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and she's big on protein and muscle building. And I'm all for that. But I think just as important is making sure that you keep your balance. And so one of the things I put in the book is something that I have instituted over the last several years is yoga. You know, I think that it's so important as you get older, you know, when we're in our 20s and our 30s, we kind of take for granted that we've got good balance, you know, that we don't worry that we're not going to have our balance. But as you get older, that's something that you lose. And so doing things like yoga Combine that with strength training, I think is so important to work both the, the, those muscle, those slow twitch muscle fibers that will help you with keeping your balance as you get older so you don't fall, uh, but also right. muscle training, uh, strength training to help with those fast twitch fibers that in case you do trip, that you're going to help to stabilize yourself. Because the last thing you want as you get older is to break a hip. Uh, there exactly. was one study that found that if you're over the age of 50 and you break your hip, there is a, it's like a 20% mortality rate in the first year in that group. It's crazy how high yeah. that is. And I'm over 50. I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's nuts. 
Uh, and so really, once again, strength training, uh, yoga, keeping your balance, working out, you've got to change how you exercise and how you work out as you get older, definitely. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know you were over 50. You certainly look young. So what yeah, you're doing is working. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was younger, but it is what it is. Yeah, I'm 43 too, man. I'm getting up there. But uh, yeah, really, really appreciate it. This was really awesome. Learned a Thank lot. Thank you, Taylor. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah. Remind everyone again, where can they follow you, learn more from you? Yeah. So uh, I'm on all the social media platforms, but uh, my book is called Younger for Life. It's available wherever books are sold. And if you go to my website, autojuvenation.com, uh, we do have a free, uh, a bunch of free gifts if you buy your book. Uh, there are links of where you can get it, but you can find it on Amazon. Then just go to autojuvenation.com, register the purchase, and then we'll send you a $30 gift certificate to try our products. Uh, we'll send you a free recipe book and a bunch of other freebies as well. So that would be the place to find me. Amazing. Dr. Tony, thank you so much for joining us here today. I've learned a lot. I'm sure everyone listening has as well. And, oh, and uh, I've thank got a you. podcast myself too, but uh, yeah. yeah. What's, the, what's the podcast? Shout it out. <laughs> it's the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. The Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. Thank you. Well, thank you for also being a surgeon that is looking for alternative ways to help people avoid surgery. Uh, really, really appreciate that. And so thank you so much. And I hope we can do it again. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Have a great day. Thank you so much for having me on. You too. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, can you please leave us a rating or review and subscribe? I've realized that while we have actually increased our downloads a lot, we're actually getting a lot of downloads, which I'm really happy about. We actually have very few ratings. So, and I realized that I've never asked people really to rate much. So I'm asking you now, if you could please rate and review and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to anyone that you think will get value out of this. Also, if you haven't checked out our line of products at buypeakperformance.com, you get 20% off your first order. That's www.buybuypeakperformance.com. Dot com. We have some incredible products, including our organic high altitude coffee. If you don't know this, coffee is one of the most heavily sprayed with pesticides out of any crop. So it's really important that you drink organic coffee. We've gone above and beyond to source what we believe is the highest quality and healthiest organic coffee in the world. We're also famous for our organic green superfood powder. You can get 20% off of that as well at buypeakperformance.com. We also have an organic vegan and paleo plant protein. See, most of the vegan proteins out there are using brown rice protein, which is really not a good source of protein, and it's also a grain. And if you're paleo, you know that grains tend to cause inflammation in some cases for some people. And so we wanted to make one that was paleo-friendly and vegan and organic. We made an amazing amino acid profile, so it's really one of the best plant proteins for muscle building. So you can check out Peak Performance Organic Plant Protein. You can find that on our website. Of course, all our products are on Amazon as well. So thanks again. And again, please, if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to someone who you feel can get value out of it. And please leave us a rating, review, and subscribe. Thank you.